Welcome to Praise, Prayer and Preaching with the Rev. Dr. Rick Dacey, Senior Minister, Wesley Congregational Life. So let us, uh, let us share together in prayer. Holy God, we pray for your strength and your grace. We pray for your heart to reveal yourself to us through your word. May we come before you dependent fully upon your spirit. Teach us, lead us, guide us, and send us out. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to invite you to do something a little, a little different here. Let's just let's look at this together as a, as a perhaps a, uh, <clears throat> uh, something to recite together. I look to myself. I will help. Join me now. I will help me because I know that's the way it works in the real world. Now, come on. I don't, I don't feel like your heart is in this. Now, come on now. We'll, we'll say it with some real spirit here. I look to myself. I will help me. You know, there's a little too much heart right over here. I looked. Where is it? Where did we go now? Did I lose it here? What do I? Oh, he's getting it back. Can you get it back for me? God, I think God had a part in that. <laughs> well, what do we do here? Oh, like, there we go. I look to myself. I will help me because I know that's the way it works in the real world. And I, I see some people just trying to help me out here. I see some people, nope, I'm not going to help you out with that. <laughs> Look, it, it's not working. I, I, I can feel your heart's not really in it. Why not? How does it feel to say those words in church? Somehow those words seem inappropriate, even offensive to say as we gather for worship. We know that that's not the way it's supposed to go. I look to the hills. Who will help me? My help will come from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Now, come on, church people, you know that that's the way it's supposed to be. Or maybe, maybe you have it by heart in a, in a memory verse in the old King James. Somehow, those words are the right words for us to say. Those, those words from Psalm 121, those are the right words, at least for Sunday. But outside this room, Outside of this hour, what is the world really saying? In what we call the real world, you lift yourself up, right? That's what's expected. That's what's celebrated. Lift yourself up. Look to yourself. If you can help others along the way, that's great. That's fine. Nothing wrong with that. But just so long as you help yourself first. Lift yourself up. Think about what's celebrated outside this hour in the 167 hours of, the, of our week beyond our Sunday worship. What's respected? What is glorified? What is admired in this world? Strength, drive, wits, experience, achievement, accumulation. The world doesn't want to hear about your relationship with God or your trust in the Lord. The world measures your worth by what you've accumulated and measures your value by what you've accomplished. Am I painting an unfair picture? Try this. Write up two CVs for yourself. One that highlights what you've accomplished in life, and one that focuses what the Lord has done for you. Which one is more likely to get you the interview? And yet, as we come into this room, into this hour, into this community, to honor and celebrate, a, we, we come in to honor and celebrate a, a very different message, a counterintuitive, a countercultural message. 
Humble yourself before God and God will lift you up. We see it in the scriptures that we, that we read this evening from James and 1 Peter. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. All who exalt themselves will be humbled and all who humble themselves will be exalted. And so, so we, we have these these parallels, and these parallels are, are not accidental. We actually see this theme woven through the scripture throughout the Old and the New Testaments. This is a, a core biblical value, humility before God. And so we have the, these two incompatible, mutually exclusive approaches to life. One says, the only one who can lift you up is you. And the other one says, the only one who can lift you up is God. So how do we, how do we reconcile these two competing claims? How do we reconcile what we celebrate in this hour with what is celebrated in the, in the other 167 hours of our week? Well, we might try to strike a compromise. Hmm? We might look to ourselves to lift ourselves up most of the time, except in emergencies or, or when we're really stuffed and, and when, when we're really desperate in desperate circumstances in our lives and, and things seem like they're going to overwhelm us, then we can go ahead and look to God. Hmm? We can, then we can humble ourselves before him and, and he can fix things up. Or we might look to ourselves to lift ourselves up, but, but act humble about it. How about that? You know, if you can, by your own wits and your own strength and your own achievement, lift yourself up and come across as humble while you're doing it, you will be widely admired and respected in this world. Am I wrong? The problem with the compromise is that it really doesn't take biblical humility seriously. It applies humility as a kind of social cosmetic. Biblical humility is not a sometimes or surface thing. It's not a facade we put on to show the world or an emergency last resort when all else fails option. The approach of the dominant culture and, and, and the biblical call to humility are not compatible with each other. They're, they're irreconcilable. We can't strike a deal between them. They are mutually exclusive. Let me give you an example. This man is not known for his humility. Now, to be fair, I, I don't know the man. And I'm not going to speak about him personally, but I do see his public persona, the persona that he projects to the world. And it's, he's one of the, uh, the leading contenders in the American presidential race, a man who boasts about the wealth that he has accumulated and the worldly success that he has achieved. He magnifies and exploits the worst aspects in the American cultural character. By, by blending his brandished bling with unabashed bigotry. It's a bit alarming to watch how enduring his popularity is in the polls. Not the man, but his persona, what he projects. How attractive it is to so many people in my homeland. You know, you know I... I I don't get into partisan politics in the pulpit. But this is really disheartening for me. It's particularly disheartening for me to see that he has consistently pulled strongly among evangelical Christians. 
people who say that biblical values drive their political thinking. This is a man who, by just about any measure, lives a public life that runs counter to biblical values. He vilifies the vulnerable. He denigrates women with vulgarities. He glorifies worldly success and constantly points to himself as the model of greatness. When asked about the faith that he claims, he outright denies that he needs or has ever really needed forgiveness from anyone, including God. And yet he waves his Bible. He waves his Bible, which he claims he sees as a terrific book. The one book, he says, that's even better than his own book, The Art of the Deal. And he tells Christians that he'll look after their interests. And people of faith are ready to cut a deal with him. You see the problem here. Donald Trump's I will lift me up has a seductive allure to it even among people who can quote their scripture, who know their memory verses, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Humble yourselves. It doesn't mean humble a bit of you. It means all of you. Humble yourself doesn't mean on Sundays or around church people. It means all the time around everyone and when no one is looking. It's a whole of life from the inside out all the way through attitude and approach to life. But what, what does it really mean beyond this hour? We know what it looks like in church. What does it mean beyond this hour? to humble ourselves before God with our whole lives, what does it mean to allow God to lift us up? Does being a faithful Christian mean putting ourselves down? Saying, oh, yo, I'm no good. I can't, I can't do anything. I, just, I don't matter. I'll never amount to anything. No. No, that's not humility. That's humiliation. And the two things are entirely different. Humiliation is when we put ourselves down or allow others to put us down. Humiliation is when, when we are made to think of ourselves as something less than what God created us to be. And that's sin. That's brokenness. That's something in need of forgiveness and healing. That's humiliation. Do you hear God saying to you that you're no good? Do you hear God saying to you, you, you've never done any good, you've never amounted to anything, and you don't matter? Because if that's the God that you're hearing, a God of humiliation, a God who wants to put you down, then you are not hearing the God who reveals himself through his word. Has God created us in his image? and called us bad? Has God abided with his people through the ages because we are worthless? Has God come among us in Christ Jesus, come among us in person, teaching and healing and feeding and suffering and dying because we don't matter? Jesus says, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do. In fact, will do greater works than these. We are called to something great, amazingly great. Does he say that because, because we can't do anything or we'll never amount to anything? No, the God revealed to us in scripture, the God made known to us in Jesus Christ is not a put you down God, he is a lift you up God. God calls humanity not to humiliation, but to humility. Humility, 
is not about putting ourselves down or allowing others to put ourselves down. Humility is about seeing ourselves as we really are, inside and out, in all our beloved humanity. To humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord is to see ourselves as God sees us, as we are created to be. And to do that, we need to look to God. Only God can see us as we are meant to see ourselves. And so we need to see through his eyes. I mean, it's hard to do. Humility, for most of us, is really hard. And, and the hard thing is that as soon as we catch ourselves being humble, we lose it. It's that elusive thing. Oh, hey, I'm, I've been pretty humble today. Oh, it's gone. And then we work to get it back. And if we achieve getting it back, then we can feel good about having achieved getting it back, and we've lost it again. We need to have a sense of humility even in our pursuit of humility and recognize that it's not something for us to achieve, it's something for us to receive as we come into God's presence, open to his transforming power and grace. Humbling ourselves before God is not passive resignation. It's a bold and active submission of our whole selves just as we are to God's will, to God's care. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. He will begin a new work in you even this very night, even this very hour. See yourself as you really are with all your gifts and all your shortcomings. You're not meant to be the entire package. That's all right. That's why he's called us into community, to connect with one another, to become a body to serve him. We're not a bunch of little Christs. We are the body of Christ together. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. See yourself as God sees you, wounded, doubting, broken, fearful, treasured, trusted, valued loved, redeemed. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Howard Cosell. Howard Cosell, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Howard Cosell. Perhaps the most famous American sports commentator of the late 20th century. He was a cultural icon. Something like a very eccentric Richie Benno. Uh, a, a very eccentric version uh, uh, of Richie, in, in that he, he had a very distinctive voice, immediately recognizable, and he was a, he was a cultural icon. People who, who knew nothing about sports knew the voice and the face of Howard Cosell, and they, they knew him by, also by his trademark bright yellow blazer that he would always wear wherever he went. Whether it was a boxing match or a gridiron or baseball game, if Howard Cosell was there, it was an event, a big event. And, and he was a very big personality, a very big personality, never shy with an opinion, not a man ever known for his modesty. But there is one thing, there's one story I, I know of Howard Cosell that illustrates an important element of humility, something that we Christians, I think, need to hear. It was the early 1980s, and Cosell and his colleague Al Michaels were in a limo, and they were going through a, a gritty part of Kansas City. Uh, they were coming home at night after, after dinner, and, and they stopped at a stoplight, and they looked out the window, and there were a couple of young guys about 17 years old, and they were engaged in a street fight. And all around them, there were young men cheering them on, egging them on, trying to get them to fight. And they were, they were having at each other. It was a pretty violent scene. And, uh, and Al Michaels, who was in the car, he, he, was, he was getting frightened. The limo driver was getting nervous, sitting at the light, and Howard Cosell opened the door to the limo and got out. And he walked over to the footpath to where these young men were fighting. 
And he stood there, as, as Michael's observed, with, the, with his toupee on top of his head and his ridiculous yellow jacket so that no one could miss him, and went chomping on his old cigar. And he stood there, and all of a sudden, the fight stopped. And Cosell, as if he were calling a boxing match, he stood and, and he said, this conflict has ended. And it did. And one of the, the boys, they're, they're all standing there gobsmacked, they're, they're, their mouths hanging open. And one of them says, Howard Cosell? Howard Cosell! And before you knew it, they were all running around like, like, he, like Howard was a maypole. And then uh, somebody found a pen, and before you knew it, Howard was signing autographs for all of them and the, patting the boys on their heads, a- including the two boys who were just about to, to kill each other in the streets. And he gets back into the, the limo, and Al Michaels and the, and the limo driver are just stunned. And they drive on about a block. And the, the limo driver finally says, Mr. Cosell, excuse me, but I have to tell you something. I have been driving for 25 years, and I thought I had seen it all. I have never seen anything like that. And Cosell responded, just remember, I know who I am. Do you see the humility in that? If it's hard for us to see humility in that, maybe it's because we confuse humility with modesty or timidity. Cosell said, I know who I am. And so he did. He knew the power of his celebrity and he put it on the line to go and break up a street fight. As Christians, we sometimes act as if humility equates to a spirit of timidity, almost as if we're embarrassed by the gifts that God has given us, lest we be seen as big noting ourselves or or, or thinking too highly of ourselves. And yet, sisters and brothers, we have something far greater, infinitely greater than any sportcaster's celebrity. We have the promise of God. We have the presence of Christ. We have the power of spirit, of the spirit among us and working through us. As the apostle says in 2 Timothy 1:7, for the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Together, we share the extraordinary privilege and responsibility of bearing Christ's name. That is a humbling privilege. The Lord is calling us and equipping us to face down injustice, to bear Christ's love, hope, and compassion among our neighbors in this city and beyond this city. That is a humbling call. Sisters and brothers, we are not called to a modest errand. We are called to an audacious mission. And we are sent with a great commission to make disciples of all nations, to take our part in his great redeeming work, the reconciliation of all creation to God. It is for this, it is for this that we humble ourselves and it is for this that he will lift us up To God alone be the glory. Amen.